We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts, and we'll be looking at the second half of Acts chapter 21, and so if you can, I would invite you to join me in Acts chapter 21 tonight. We'll be there in just a few minutes, and as we begin, I just want to say that I hope to see all of you for worship this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11. Use the Sign Up Genius account if you can, if you're one of our members, if you're a have an address, an email address in the church directory that should work for you. If you have any trouble with that, get in touch with me or with Kenna. And then we hope everybody can join us for class at 10 in between. So uh, join us this Sunday, 9 and 11, 9 or 11 for worship. And then in between those two for class at 10. And guests are always welcome. If you're visiting with us, if you're not a member yet, uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, be there on Sunday. No need to sign up, but you are always welcome to join us. Tonight we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, some of the Acts of some of the Apostles, I think as we have uh, titled or described this book in the past, and we know that it's written by the, the uh, good brother Luke, the beloved physician. He writes the book of Luke and also the book of Acts, kind of volume 1, volume 2, volume 1 being about the life of Jesus. And then volume two, the book of Acts, uh, focusing in on some of the acts of some of the apostles. So Peter at the beginning, and then we've been with Paul for a number of weeks now in the second, roughly two-thirds of that book. By way of very brief review and reminder, if, in case you're joining us for the first time tonight, we're looking at the ABCs of Acts, kind of a memory tool. And I would invite you to write these in under the heading of each chapter. If you're using a hard copy of the Bible, if you're able to make notes in your digital copy, uh, that would be great as well. But chapter 1 for the letter A is Ascension, the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. Chapter 2 is the beginning of the church. Chapter 3 is about the uh, man who couldn't walk, who was carried and cured. We had the determined disciples in chapter 4. and chapter 5, the empty jail. The first deacons with the question mark in chapter 6. In chapter 7, we had Stephen, the great hero. In chapter 8, we had the eunuch asking, how can I? In chapter 9, I am Jesus. In chapter 10, the journey to Joppa. In chapter 11, we had the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles. In chapter 12, Peter is liberated again. In chapter 13, missionaries sent out. The first missionary journey begins. In chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas had to convince the crowds that they are not gods but men. In 15, we had the reminder that the old law is not binding. In chapter 16, the Philippian jailer is converted. In chapter 17, questions answered in Athens, with Paul preaching on the Areopagus there in Athens, Greece. In chapter 18, we had reasoning with a preacher, with Priscilla and Aquila pulling Apollos aside to explain to him the way of God more accurately. In chapter 19, we had saving our religious friends. So Paul questions and then baptizes those 12 men at Ephesus who had been baptized improperly the first time. In chapter 20, Troas on the Lord's Day, then followed by Paul's message to the elders from Ephesus on the beach at Miletus. And then last week, if you were with us, you may remember we started Acts 21. As Paul gets closer to Jerusalem, uh, he meets Agabus the prophet. Agabus, of course, predicts that when Paul gets to Jerusalem, he will be bound and delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. So we'll finally uh, get to that tonight, but the summary of Acts 21 is uproar in Jerusalem. So the letter U, uproar in Jerusalem. By way of review, we're on the very tail end of Paul's third missionary journey. So we've looked at journeys one, two, now three. And tonight we come to the very end of it. So he's been traveling for roughly five years from 52 to 57 AD, starting up in Antioch, spending a good chunk of time in Ephesus, and then heading through Greece for a little bit, picking up famine relief along the way to help the saints in Jerusalem. In the rest of Acts 21, then, he finally makes it back to Jerusalem. So that's where we are tonight with Paul arriving in Jerusalem at the very end of the third missionary journey. So let's pick up tonight then with Acts 21, and our first paragraph is verses 15 through 22. Acts 21, verses 15 through 22. After these days, we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking us to Manassan of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to lodge. After we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly, and the following day Paul, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. 
After he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they had heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Well, again, this passage brings us to the end of Paul's third missionary journey. He finally makes it back to Jerusalem. His last stop was Caesarea, where they meet Philip and his daughters, where Agabus gives that prophecy about Paul being bound in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. And so in this passage, we find that some of the disciples from Caesarea come along with Paul for that last leg of the journey down to Jerusalem, or up to Jerusalem, we would say back then, because it's going up in elevation into the mountains. So once they arrive in Jerusalem, they stay with Manasseh of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing. That's a little bit unusual because Manasseh certainly sounds like a Greek, a non-Jewish name. Uh, he's from Cyprus, the island in the Mediterranean, but he is living in Jerusalem and he's been a Christian for some time, for quite a while. So it kind of makes sense. This is kind of a transition step. So Paul, being a Jew himself, is staying with somebody of a Gentile background uh, right there in the city of Jerusalem. And again, to me, it's almost as if they are uh, easing Paul back into the city of Jerusalem. This would be quite the transition. So this is the end of the third missionary journey. I know it's not usually labeled like this, but I think we could also say that this is, in a way, the beginning of what might be known as Paul's fourth missionary journey, if there is such a thing. Or maybe we would label it as his journey to Rome. It really starts here, and we'll see this more and more as we get into it. Uh, it's certainly not planned like a missionary journey. They didn't uh, pray about this and do research and send people out and that kind of thing. But what happens in the rest of Acts 21 is basically the beginning of a series of events eventually leading Paul to the city of Rome. Of course, he'll be in chains. This is not something he does willingly, uh, but certainly uh, God is able to use this in a powerful way. So he's on his way, but he really doesn't know it quite yet. Uh, right away, though, the next day after arriving in Jerusalem, Paul checks in with James and the elders of the congregation. This is James, the Lord's brother. Uh, more accurately, we might describe this man as the Lord's half-brother. And uh, James is considered to be a pillar in the church. We learn this in Galatians 2, verse 9, so he's very influential. Uh, some have suggested that James is in Jerusalem, perhaps to uh, train these elders, kind of to bring them up to speed, to give them some... Uh, more information to teach. Uh, I don't know whether we've thought about this, but we have schools of preaching to train preachers today, but we don't always have similar programs for training elders. Uh, obviously, elders are older men, generally established in the community. They've got their own careers, their own families. They're, uh, they're there. And so it doesn't really make sense to have elders travel to a far-off school to train to be elders for a few years. And yet there is a value to training. Years ago, I remember Fried Hardeman University made it clear and uh, made it easier for those who were um, majoring in majors other than Bible to have Bible as a double major. And this was the reasoning. They wanted to uh, train young men to be elders, not immediately, but at some point far off in the future. So to give them a comprehensive education in Bible to uh, help them to be more qualified to serve as elders someday. And I appreciate that, but I just mention this because uh, some have suggested that James is maybe training these men as elders here. So James and the elders. Not that he was in charge of the elders, uh, but he's obviously well known in that congregation. So Paul then, he's getting ready to give a report to these men concerning what's been accomplished in his travels over the past five years. Uh, specifically, according to verse 19, Paul is reporting on what God has done among the Gentiles. So note uh, this is not about what Paul is doing. This is not about me, 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 look what I did on my journeys. Uh, but this is all about what God has been doing. And I think this certainly fits in with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God who was causing the growth. And that's kind of what we see reflected here. Uh, I was also thinking Paul might have reported on what had been accomplished among the Jews on his travels. Um, but the Jews, for the most part, ran him out of town, didn't he? Uh, 
And so this is not a report of what Paul is accomplishing among the Jews. This is what he's doing among the Gentiles. So generally speaking, uh, the Jews refused to listen and they in fact persecuted Paul. So it's the Gentiles who were the uh, most receptive to the gospel. Uh, starting down in verse 20, the reaction to James and the elders is that they begin glorifying God. They seem to be thrilled by this. So they're listening. This is good news. They're happy about what Paul has accomplished. However, notice that they very quickly bring up a concern. They have a large number of new Jewish converts there in Jerusalem, and these people are zealous for the law. And so they have a huge respect for the law of Moses. Obviously, they would, being from a Jewish background. But not just respect, this goes beyond that. These men are zealous for the law. Remember, the temple still hasn't been destroyed at this point, so from their point of view, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. They have obeyed the Lord in baptism, but they're still continuing on with many of their Jewish uh, traditions. And so they are perhaps still worshiping God in the temple. They are still perhaps honoring those holy days and and worshiping in the way that they had been accustomed to in the past, at least perhaps. And the elders are concerned um, for what these people have been told about Paul, that Paul is uh, teaching the Jews on his travels among the Gentiles that they are to forsake Moses. Uh, the word forsake in this passage is a word I think we would recognize in the English language as the word apostasy. So they saw Paul as teaching the Jews on his journeys to apostatize, to leave the faith. So they saw Paul as uh, teaching the Jews to, to leave the Jewish faith completely, in a sense demanding that they stop circumcising their children and to abandon all of their customs. Of course, we never see Paul really uh, do anything like this. That's not his focus on that journey. Uh, but when we hear these accusations, um, uh, what they're saying is, is obviously not completely true. Remember back in Acts 16.3, uh, Paul actually had Timothy circumcised when he picked him up in Lystra on the second missionary journey. Remember, Timothy's mother and grandmother were Jewish, but his father was Greek, and so he hadn't been circumcised. And Paul is taking him on board as a fellow missionary, and, and he's thinking, this is going to be a problem. And so he doesn't do it to save Timothy, not to fulfill the old law. He's not obeying Moses. But he did that from a customary point of view, just as a tradition, in order for Timothy to be more accepted among the Jewish people. And so... It wasn't something necessary for salvation, um, but in the same way, it wasn't something that they were forbidden from doing. Uh, but it was an expedient, kind of to take away one more objection from those who might consider following the Lord. And I just say this to prepare us for what happens next in this passage. I think one of the most difficult passages to understand uh, really anywhere in the book of Acts. But this is the concern that's raised by the elders in Jerusalem. After five years of preaching to the Gentiles, uh, Paul now has quite the reputation among the Jews for trashing their customs, at least the way they see it. And so they ask in verse 22, what then is to be done? Uh, they will certainly hear that you have come. And so it kind of sounds like uh, like an elders meeting, which it is, isn't it? And so they, they are looking into the future, trying to anticipate problems they might face. And they're asking Paul, what do we do about this? Because we see this as potentially being a huge issue. So let's continue then tonight with Acts 21, verses 23 through 26. Acts 21, 23 through 26. Therefore, do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. And all will know that there is nothing to the things which they have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly keeping the law. But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, having decided that they should abstain from meat sacrifice to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men and the next day, purifying himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. So the elders have what they see to be a, a solution to this problem. They have four men who are under a vow, maybe the Nazarite vow. We're not told. I guess we wish we had a lot more information about this that we don't have. But these men are coming to the end of it. So it's getting to the point where they need to shave their heads. They've been letting their hair grow for a while. So they need to purify themselves in the temple as they pay some kind of a fee. Again, this is not 
uh, forgiveness of sins. This is not to be forgiven of something that they've done. This is the uh, some kind of vow that they've taken, some kind of voluntary vow. So the elders, uh, they want Paul to purify himself along with these men, paying their expenses in the process, kind of as a public statement. And Paul goes along with this. As I said, this is one of the most challenging passages in the book of Acts. I'm afraid we don't have a rock-solid answer to it, at least for what happens next and what happens in this passage. Uh, it certainly seems as if Paul is following the law of Moses, something he very uh, clearly condemns as being necessary for salvation in some of his other letters, letters like Romans and Galatians, uh, major letters, letters written before and after this event. Um, as I was studying this passage and trying to make sense of it myself again, I found Wayne Jackson's comments very helpful on this. And I'll try to put a link to his article in the description of tonight's video, maybe also in the email and the Facebook notification, uh, the live stream comments. But here are, the main, here are the main possibilities that some have suggested. And I, I love this about Brother Jackson's writings, that uh, he can take a complex issue and he can boil it down to some bullet points that actually make sense. And that's what he's done here. And again, I'm very thankful for what he's done here. Uh, first of all, some have suggested that Luke just makes this up, that this never happened. But but uh, Luke makes it up to kind of add in to the book of Acts here to make the book of Acts more appealing to the Jews. So uh, Luke is basically lying to us. That's one possibility that some have suggested. I just want to note Wayne Jackson is not suggesting this, but as he has digested all that's been written on this, uh, this is one thing that uh, that has been suggested. And obviously, this does not fit in with what we know about Luke, does it? It doesn't fit in with what we know about the inspiration of the Bible. We don't see Luke making stuff up elsewhere. So I think we can very safely just mark this off the list of possibilities. <clears throat> the second possibility is that Paul just blew it on this one, that he just didn't know any better, that he was ignorant and mistaken. So the elders suggest this solution, and Paul just kind of ignorantly says, well, sure, why not? Let's just go ahead and do this without really thinking it through and, and remembering the implications of what this might mean. Um, however, knowing what we know about Paul from the books that he wrote, uh, Paul does not appear to be very ignorant on the law of Moses, does he? <laughs> you can't get much past Paul on the law. And so it, it does not seem like Paul is mistaken here. Plus, Luke doesn't seem to condemn this at all. And uh, Luke doesn't record this as if it's a bad thing, does he? There's no correction. There's no sense that Paul is mistaken here. So this really doesn't seem uh, like a valid uh, response. Not that Paul could never be mistaken, but uh, just keep this in mind. This is something that's been thrown out there. Uh, the third possibility is that Paul knew that it would be wrong to do this and that he did it anyway, that he sinned intentionally and maybe that he caved under the pressure from the elders. So the elders said, Paul, we need you to do this. And Paul in his mind said to himself, well, I know this is stupid. I know it's wrong, uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to do it anyway, even though it's sinful. Uh, but again, this isn't condemned at all by Luke. That The, the context doesn't read as if this is a, a sin. It uh, doesn't fit in with what we know about Paul elsewhere. Certainly, Paul is not above sinning. Uh, Peter sinned from time to time as an apostle. We read about his denial of Jesus in the gospel accounts. We read about Peter's hypocrisy with the Gentiles in Galatians. So it's not that Paul uh, couldn't have sinned, and yet he's not condemned in this passage. Uh, plus, this would also suggest that James and the elders sinned as well, right? If this is the case, then then James sinned and the elders sinned by asking Paul to do this. And so this really doesn't make sense for a number of reasons. I think we could add in here, plus Paul, he appeals to this incident as he appeals to Governor Felix later in Acts 24, 17 and 18. When he looks back on this and he says to Felix, now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar, and so on. And so if Paul sinned, then he is defending this sin and defending his life before Felix by appealing to this sin in front of a government official. And certainly we combine that in there, and that really, when we start looking into it, that makes no sense at all. So that... I believe, leaves us with what is the most likely scenario, 
And that is, uh, Paul is acting expediently in this situation. He's not trusting the law of Moses for salvation. He's not doing this ignorantly. He's not knowing that it's wrong and doing it anyway. Uh, but he did whatever he could do with a good conscience uh, for the purpose of becoming all things to all people. And we actually read about this in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 through 22. I've kind of put that on the screen there. 1 Corinthians 9, 20 through 22. This is where Paul said, To the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as though under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I, so that I may by all means save some. So, uh, this is not a perfect explanation. There are still some things that I wish I knew about what goes down here. And I still have some unanswered questions on this, but at least to me, uh, this seems to be the most likely scenario, that Paul uh, went along with this plan with a good conscience, not to save himself by following the law of Moses. This is not something he did for the forgiveness of his sins, uh, but rather he did this in order to try to take away a possible objection in the eyes of some of the Jews who thought that he had perhaps become completely hostile to the law of Moses, which is not the case. Paul had a, a great respect for the law of Moses. It just you had to understand it in its place. And so he went as far as he could in good conscience to become like them in this, to identify with the Jewish people. Another part of this is that in their eyes, Paul had become ceremonially unclean, hadn't he, by interacting with the heathens over the past few years. Of course, that's not the way Paul looked at it, but he's been preaching to Gentiles. He's been touching Gentiles. They've been touching him. He's been eating their food, eating in their homes, and so on. And so in their mind, as faithful Jews in Jerusalem who had obeyed the gospel, uh, Paul would need to cleanse himself before coming to Jerusalem and preaching in the temple. He was dirty ceremonially. And as I understand it, this uncleanness was, was almost contagious in their mind. In other words, if you're unclean and you touch me for some reason, then I become clean. And then the person I touch becomes unclean and so on. And so for Paul to teach and preach in Jerusalem, he would almost need to jump through their hoops, so to speak, uh, to have any chance of getting through to these people. Um, I know it's not a perfect example, but um, earlier today I made a visit to a woman at UW Hospital. And, you know, one condition of making a visit might be wearing a gown, right? Um, many times through the years, I've had to gown up and wear the mask and, uh, you know, the, the goggles and the gloves. And I've had to go through that, not just for the coronavirus, but for years and years. If you visit somebody in some infectious disease unit and they want to protect you and, you know, again, it's not a perfect illustration, but I might think all of that is ridiculous. I might think, ah, this is, this is a bit of overkill here. And yet, for me not to get tackled by a nurse, <laughs> this is what I need to do to get through some doors to go pray with somebody. Does that make sense to you? Again, it, it's not a perfect parallel, but I hope it makes sense. To me, that seems to be perhaps something of what Paul is doing here. He is he is bending as far as he can with a good conscience for the sake of reaching people with the gospel. If you have any other thoughts on this, I would love to hear from you. Uh, but I think you'll agree with me. This is a rather strange account, isn't it? It is a difficult passage, probably the, the most difficult passage to understand in the book of Acts. Well, let's continue tonight with Acts 21, verses 27 through 30. Acts 21, 27 through 30. When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law in this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together together. 
And taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Um, in this paragraph, I find it interesting that even after Paul does everything possible to bend <laughs> and to be accepted by this pe these people, he's doing everything he can to get to their level and to identify with them despite all of this. The Jews who had followed him from Asia come in, and seeing him in the temple, they get everybody riled up all over again. And this is certainly keeping with their character of harassing Paul all around the Mediterranean world over and over again. By the way, these Jews from Asia are pretty much doing what Paul did before he obeyed the gospel, aren't they? Um, they are harassing the disciples of Jesus, and they are doing so with enthusiasm, just as Saul did earlier. So this is Paul a number of years earlier. And uh, they're following his enthusiasm and, and his zeal. Their first accusation is that Paul here is preaching against our people. Is Paul preaching against the Jewish people? Is he railing on them? No, that's not what's going on here. In reality, Paul is helping his people. He's helping the nation of Israel. He's bringing famine relief back to the churches in Greece, uh, from the churches in Greece. So he's, he's doing the opposite of harassing them. Uh, the other accusation here is that Paul is preaching against the law and the temple, um, even defiling the temple by bringing Gentiles into the temple. And again, is that true? No, it's not true at all. They, they saw Paul with Trophimus, so they saw him walking with Trophimus, a Greek man in the city of Jerusalem. They then assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple, although that is not the case at all. Also note, they saw Paul with Trophimus, one Greek, and they assumed that he had brought Greeks, plural, into the temple. So a number of conclusions have been jumped to here, I think we could say. So they jumped there without any actual evidence. So they see Paul hanging out with somebody, and they extrapolate that to Paul bringing multiple people into the temple itself. That was against their law. This is something Paul would not have done. There were signs all over. Um, I actually saw one of those signs at a Jewish museum. It was on loan from uh, Jerusalem University. Oh, kind of on the south side of uh, Cleveland, Ohio, a number of years ago. They had, I don't know, maybe 24 inches wide, 12 or 18 inches tall, about 12 inches thick. And it was in two languages, top and bottom, in Greek, maybe in Aramaic or Hebrew. But uh, basically, if you die because you cross this fence, um, your death is on your own hands. I'm just paraphrasing there, but there were signs all over the place warning against this. So this is not what Paul had done at all. But by the way, this, this accusation about, you know, speaking against the temple, that was made against both Jesus and also Stephen, wasn't it? That they are blaspheming the temple and, and so on. And we know how those two situations turned out. But the result of these accusations is that they succeed in getting everybody upset. They create an uproar, don't they? As we've summarized this chapter in the ABCs of Acts, there is now an uproar in Jerusalem. And this word uproar will actually be used again in the next paragraph. But by doing this, they fulfill the prophecy made by Agabus, at least part of it at this point. Uh, they take hold of Paul, so they physically overwhelm him. They drag him uh, out of the temple. Uh, just a thought question here before we move on. Uh, what's the advantage of being in a mob when something evil is being done? What's the advantage to that? Well, I think people are often able to avoid being held accountable personally, aren't they? If there's a thousand people doing a wrong thing in a crowd, it's kind of hard to nail it down and pin that on one person. So that's the danger, this mob mentality. So when thousands of people join together in a mob like this, it's very difficult to nail down individuals. And I think that's kind of why it builds on itself. This mob gets out of control and everybody's screaming and yelling and eventually they don't even know why they're there. But uh, it's trouble for whoever they're, they're arrayed, uh, aligned against. Uh, let's conclude tonight with Acts 21, verses 31 through 36. We'll leave the last little paragraph for next week there at the end. You'll notice we're not going all the way through verse 40. Uh, because the last few verses actually introduce Paul's speech in chapter 22, so it kind of goes with that, and we'll, we'll save that for next week. But let's wrap it up tonight with Acts 21, 31 through 36. So the uproar intensifies, Acts 21, 31 through 36. While they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. <laughs> 
At once he took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came up and took hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains, and he began asking who he was and what he had done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another, and when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. When he got to the stairs, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people kept following them, shouting, Away with him! Well, in the first few verses here, we have the reminder that Jer Jerusalem is operating under the illusion of being self-governing. They kind of were self-governing, but Rome was in charge. But Rome allowed them to pretty much do their own thing as long as they were able to maintain law and order. If the cr crowds, if the locals got too rowdy, though, if it got out of control of the Jewish authorities, Rome would very quickly step in and they would take away their right to self-rule at least momentarily, maybe permanently, but that's what we see starting here. The crowd is so fired up. Uh, they're at the point of nearly killing Paul right there on the spot. No trial, no justice. It's just mob rule, kind of like as they did with Stephen. But word makes its way to the commander of the Roman cohort, and he immediately floods this area with soldiers. So he takes along some soldiers and centurions. A centurion, of course, was a man in charge of a hundred troops. And so if several centurions are brought in here, what does that tell us? He didn't just bring centurions, but he probably also brought the men that came along with those centurions. So this might have included several hundred Roman soldiers. I might try to show this again next week, but I think most of us know that the Romans actually built a fortress uh, connected to the temple in Jerusalem. It was the Antonia or Antonia Fortress, depending on where, what you read about that. As we know, uh, King Herod funded the temple, did a lot of renovations and improvements to it during his years. But as a condition, he basically said, um, I'm going to build you this nice temple, do some renovations here. Uh, but as a condition, I'm going to build this little fortress over here. Okay, I'm going to little tack this little thing over on the side. And this is a scale model of the temple in Jerusalem. If, you, if we were to uh, kind of do the wide angle lens of this scene, we would see people appearing to be 100 feet tall looking down on this. So this is a little scale model, maybe uh, three or four feet high and a, you know, a dozen or so feet across. So we're kind of looking down on a scale model here. But in the lower left-hand corner, we have the temple courtyard. And we've got the colonnade, kind of the porch around the outside of the temple there, kind of defining that flat spot, the uh, temple courtyard. And then over kind of to the upper right, really right in the middle of this picture, we have um, the fortress. We've got these four huge guard towers. I think they were roughly 60 feet tall in real life, and they are connected around a fortress. And it was huge. So 60 feet tall, it's like a six-story building, right? So this huge fortress connected right to the temple, and the Romans used it as barracks. So they, they slept there. This was something of a, a headquarters for the Roman military in Jerusalem, and it was very strategically placed. And I think, as you can imagine, with the, the connections and stairways and tunnels and all that, they could very quickly, just within seconds, they could absolutely flood the temple area with hundreds upon hundreds of soldiers if needed. So in case of any unrest, uh, they could just open those doors. They could just flood that area immediately, like having a police station attached to some place like Camp Randall Stadium. You know, there's a reason for that. And this is what happens here. Paul is in the temple courtyard area. The crowd goes wild, thousands of people about to tear this man limb from limb. The commander gets word of this and he immediately sends in the troops. So these troops just flood down those stairways right into that temple courtyard to rescue Paul. And in verse 32, when the crowd see the commander and the soldiers coming, you know, the doors have been opened, and uh, it's, it's getting unleashed on them here. So they stop beating Paul immediately. They, they back away. Rome is obviously not perfect, right? But they do save Paul's life here by maintaining law and order. And I think we can say that about a lot of governments around the world. There is no perfect system, uh, but generally speaking, just as a general truth in life, government is there to maintain law and order. And that's what Rome does here. They save Paul's life. In verse 33, the commander starts sorting things out. You think about cops arriving on a terrible scene. That's the first thing. What's going on? Who are you? What are you doing here? Kind of thing. So they put Paul in chains. Not that he had necessarily done anything wrong, 
commander probably has some suspicions. We'll see that, I think, next week. But they, they try to figure out who he is. In verse 34, though, the crowd is still quite rowdy. They're shouting. Nobody seems to agree on anything. Just total chaos. And so the commander order, orders Paul, bring this guy into the barracks. We're going to sort this out in quiet so we can deal with this. Uh, when the crowd sees they're about to lose their chance to kill Paul on the spot, they press in even harder. They, and it gets to the point where the soldiers have to actually lift Paul off the ground and carry him up the stairs. So kind of mosh pit style here, isn't it? Um, I'm thinking, uh, speaking of that, I'm thinking of the tragedy down in Texas a few days ago where several were crushed to death by the crowd at the concert. Right? That seems to be what, what's happening here. We have this massive crowd of people, thousands all pressing in on Paul, uh, even to the point where the soldiers lift him up over the violence as they head up the stairs into the barracks. And uh, we end this passage and we end our class tonight with the mob shouting, away with him, away with him. And uh, where have we seen that before? Where have we heard a crowd shouting like this before? Aren't we thinking of Jesus as the crowds were shouting, crucify him? They didn't care whether he was innocent or guilty. That wasn't the point. They wanted that man dead. They wanted the Lord dead. And in the same way, they're now doing it to the Apostle Paul. And this is where we'll leave it this week. Next week, as he's carried up the stairs, Paul will ask the commander for permission to speak, which is amazing. Paul is nearly killed. And <laughs> just a minute, can I talk to these people? <laughs> just an amazing thing that Paul is willing to do that. And the actual speech is then recorded for us in chapter 22. So we'll look at the last few verses of chapter 21 next week, and then we'll combine that with his speech in uh, chapter 22 in next week's study. But tonight, though, we have uh, studied the uproar in Jerusalem. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to study with us tonight. I hope you can be present for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 11, and be there for class uh, in between those two services at 10. And uh, snow might be on the way, so come prepared for that. I'm looking forward to being outside before and uh, between those services and classes. I like being out there in the fresh air personally. If, if I'm out there alone, I guess that's all right. But I would love for somebody to join me out there. Some of you may want to get some fresh air as well. Uh, but let me know if there's something we need to be praying about over the next several days. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we've studied your messenger Paul and his efforts to bring the good news of your son back to the city of Jerusalem. We're thankful for Paul's persistence and for his courage, and we certainly ask for the same strength and the same wisdom as we reach out to those around us. We are thankful for those times when government protects our ability to teach and preach. We pray that you would bless those who have been given the responsibility of maintaining law and order in the city of Madison and in other communities around us even today. We know that in some sense they are serving you by protecting us, and so we ask that you would bless their efforts and keep them safe. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for saving us from sin. Guide us this evening and give us restful sleep. In Jesus we pray. Amen.